Scripture makes it clear that we are saved by faith alone, and yet it's possible to believe the gospel is true without ever being changed by that knowledge. So what's the difference between mere belief and saving faith? How can we know if our faith is genuine? That's our subject today on Truth For Life. Alistair Begg has titled this message, Held and Holding Firmly. We began last time in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15 by paying careful attention to the message which Paul was proclaiming, and we noted his very strong emphasis on the gospel. And we find that Paul, in this case, as in each case, is overtly concerned that his class, if you like, those who are under his tutelage, will be in absolutely no doubt as to the course of study upon which they have embarked. He is quite unashamed of his constant reminders, and indeed, the way in which he begins this section, he then wraps it before moving on in the 11th verse by declaring to his readers, whether then it was I or they, whether it was someone else or myself, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. As we're going to discover again this morning, the gospel, the good news, is at the very heart of Paul's proclamation. Paul himself, in opening up his letter to the Corinthians, says to them in the 17th verse of chapter 1, and we noted this last time, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And if we had had occasion to meet Paul, if we had been encountered by him in one of his... uh, preaching sessions in some of the cities that he uh, visited, we would have been very, very clear that this Apostle Paul was consumed with the issue of the gospel. In light of that, it seems to follow to me that whenever you preach the Bible at all, you are essentially preaching the gospel, because the whole of the Bible focuses on Jesus— And the whole story of Jesus is about Jesus and the death on the cross and his resurrection. And therefore, the whole thrust of continual study of Scripture will not be to the detriment of making sense of the rest of the Bible, but it will be to give us the indication that there is a crossroads encounter with Christ, which the unbeliever should be able to detect as God works in his life, and also that the believer would be strengthened by the awareness of this to make clear to the world to which we return that what we are about is the message of good news. Now, I was greatly encouraged a couple of years ago when in reading a book called A Quest for Godliness on the Puritans, written by J.I. Packer, I came across a statement which actually reverberated with my own heart. I'd never, ever seen this written down. And when I found it, I immediately had my secretary type it up and put it in a little perspex thing so that I could have it on my desk. It goes like this. If one preaches the Bible biblically, one cannot help preaching the gospel all the time. And every sermon will be, as Bolton said, at least by implication, evangelistic. Okay? I'm going to tell you it again. It's very important. You want to know what makes me tick? You come in my study, look around. You come in my bedroom, look around. All the books and stuff that's lying around there, you can find uh, Winston Churchill in there. Um, You can find Louis L'Amour in there. You can find a lot of stuff about me if you just scurry around. You come in my office, my study, you'll find right against me, if one preaches the Bible biblically, one cannot help preaching the gospel all the time, and every sermon will be, as Bolton, one of the Puritans, said, at least by implication, evangelistic. Now, if you get a hold of that, it will help you to understand the pastoral team that God has given you here. This past week, we went on a retreat together in order that we might advance, and uh, we spent time in rest and in prayer and fellowship, study, planning. And in the course of that time, we focused on a book which we're using in our pastoral team meetings entitled Pastors and Teachers. We're studying it together in the hope that we might understand better what it means to be a pastor and a teacher. And on Wednesday, we focused on a section entitled Goals and Priorities, in the course of which we spent some time 
on this somewhat extensive quote. And the reason I give it to you is, again, so that you might understand what it is that drives and equips and stirs the hearts of those who have been given the privilege of pastoring and shepherding here at Parkside Church. The author says, "...the body of Christ is not only to care for its spiritual maturity, but it is also to grow." Our responsibility is not solely for the flock already gathered in, but for those other sheep who are to be called. The body of Christ is healthy as, through the works of service her members are equipped to fulfill, she reaches out into the world and obeys her master's final commission to preach the good news to every creature. A true pastor's concern is for the other sheep who have not yet heard the great shepherd's call. Our goal is to equip God's people to be fishers of men and women. This was a priority purpose of our Lord Jesus Christ for his disciples. In other words, that their driving impetus in the hearts of the pastors is that those sheep that are already gathered in under the auspices of Parkside Church might be equipped to become fishers of men. But when push comes to shove, as long as the ninety and nine are safely in the fold, the pastor is going for the one. That was the whole story. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who have no need of repentance. That the existence of the church is not simply that it might sit around and congratulate itself on how well it is doing, but that it might be consumed, focused on the fact that it is being equipped. It is discovering the truth of the Bible. It is enabled in its spiritual gifting in order to become fishers of men, in order to become, like Paul, those who declare the gospel. And if God's people are going to proclaim the good news, then they must understand it fully so that they can communicate it simply. Not simply that you might be able to memorize what you're told, but so that you might understand. Because if all that we do is memorize to mimic parrot fashion, then as soon as somebody hits us with a question for which we have not been given the pat answer and the key verse, then we're completely at sea. A bit like me when I was doing mathematics at school. All I could do were the, the ones from the example in the book. As long as the exam was as per the example in the book, I was okay. As soon as they threw in a zinger, I was in deep difficulty. And, of course, they threw in the zingers with great frequency, and so I spent a lot of unhappy days in relationship to that. The problem was not that I didn't show up at the class. The problem was not that I was unprepared to memorize the material. The problem was that I didn't understand. So, loved ones, you have to understand the theology fully so that you may be able to articulate simply. Anybody can make stuff complicated. That's easy. The hard part is to make it simple. So, to this end we labor, striving with all of the strength that God supplies so that after we have departed, you will be able to bring these things to mind. Now, we're still in verse 2, if you recall from last time, because there is a little section there which we never completed. A little problem statement that some of us may have tripped over and wondered about, so I want to address it with you. I'm referring to the final statement in verse 2, otherwise you have believed in vain. What does he mean, you have believed in vain? Well, I want you to understand this, that what Paul is addressing here is not a warning against the true believer losing their salvation. Rather, he is providing a warning against the kind of faith that doesn't save. You need to cross-reference this. It's not our purpose this morning. But, for example, if you read the opening chapter of James 1, you get James's question, can such faith save? Actually, into 2 and on to 3. Is this a saving faith? He says, no, this is not faith which saves. And so Paul says, it is imperative that you understand that the gospel brings you into an experience which not only redeems you from your sin, but saves you and keeps you. And if you are not holding firmly to the Word, then the faith that you have adopted is not a faith that saves. 
And there are all kinds of people who will declare that they have faith, but they have no assurance of salvation. They have no experience of the transforming power of God within their lives. Their faith is something that they have essentially latched onto rather than the faith which Paul describes here. Namely, that one's ability to hold firmly is not a means to being or staying saved but one's ability to hold firmly is an evidence of having been firmly held. Only those who are firmly held hold firmly. It is our continuance which gives evidence of the fact that we have been taken up and held. Our continuance is not the ground of our salvation. That is at the cross, whereby we have been picked up and held fast, but our holding firmly is the evidence of that transaction having taken place. Well, says somebody, what about those who forsake Jesus, those who turn away from the church and uh, by their life and by their lifestyle and by their public profession reject fully all that they once profess to believe? Well, the only answer that we can realistically bring to that from Scripture is that such an individual never, ever had genuine faith in the first place. If you want to clarify that in your mind, turn to 1 John and chapter 2. If you turn from the book of Revelation back the way into your Bible, it goes Revelation and then Jude and then 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John 2 and verse 19, John wrote his uh, letter in order to bring assurance to those who have professed faith. He wrote his gospel in order that men and women might come to faith. And here he addresses the question of those who have disengaged themselves from the body of Christ. And this is how he describes it. Verse 19 of chapter 2, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. <coughs> belonging is a very important thing, is it not? A sense of belonging. It's very important to a child to know that he or she belongs to a family. If you're in a sports club, you like to get the membership roster and to look at it and to find out if your name is printed there because it gives to you a sense of belonging. When we think in terms of our engagement with Christ, it is a wonderful thing to be described in biblical terms as those who belong to Jesus. One of the hymns we love to sing, sometimes sing it in the evening at a baptismal service, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. And this morning, as I stand before you, years and years into my own spiritual pilgrimage, I marvel at the fact that I'm still holding firmly. And I know for sure that it must be because I'm being firmly held. Because when I think about the perversity of my own heart, when I think about how prone I am to wander away, when I think about how easy it is for me to sin, when I think how significantly possible it is, like in Pilgrim's Progress, to get in Bypath Meadow or to get in Doubter's Castle or to get in any of these side streets, there's no sense of pride in my heart to look back over the vantage point of a year and another year and another year. I find myself saying with a hymn writer, when I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he can hold me fast. I could never keep my hold. He must hold me fast. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, the chorus goes. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast. Surely one of the great thrills for a dad is when that little toddler, girl, or boy, whatever it is, gets to be able to take those early steps 
And when for the first time you no longer have to carry them or push them, but you can walk beside them. And when the first time you came to walk across the traffic and they looked, they looked at this melee and they looked up at you and their heart beat, you reached down and you took their tiny hand in your hand and they held firmly onto you because you had determined to hold firmly onto them. Listen, if you've got a Christian faith this morning whereby you're hanging on by your fingernails to God, then I don't know that you have understood saving faith. If you are hanging on to God as a result of how well you've done this past week, or how many times you've read your Bible, or how many times you've witnessed, or how many times you didn't think the bad thought, or whatever else it is, and when something comes across your mind and says, I wonder if I'm a Christian, you find yourself saying, oh yes, I am because of this and this and this and this and this. I'm holding on. And you don't understand. The only reason any of us are holding on is because he picked us up in his almighty embrace and gathered us to himself. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life gift, and they will never perish, neither will any man pluck them out of my hand. This morning, the ground of our assured conviction concerning the nature of the good news in our own lives is on the fact that we have found our tiny hand nestled under the warm and large and powerful eternal embrace of God our Father. And when sin comes into our lives as it inevitably does, It spoils our fellowship, but it does not negate our relationship. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, let us get on from here into the section that begins at verse 3 and ends at verse 11. I want through these subsequent verses to notice three elements. First of all, the priority of the message, and then the reliability of the evidence, and then thirdly, the testimony of the apostle. We will go no further probably than the first of these today. The priority of the message. What I received, he says in verse 3, I pressed on to you as of first importance. This was not some marginal issue. It was right at the top of the list. Now, I want you to notice carefully that this message did not originate with the Apostle Paul. He received it, and he passed it on. There are all kinds of messages out on the streets at the moment that originate with mere men and women. Christian science and the Bible. People are scuttling into these little things to read books that originated with the people themselves. Paul says, listen, you're not involved with a cult. It doesn't originate with an individual. It actually originates with God. It didn't even originate with the apostle Paul. He was passing on what he had received. The language that he uses here is the same language you get in 1 Corinthians 11 when he introduces the Lord's Supper. He says the same thing, for what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. Parodidomai, paralambano, two key technical words which simply mean the transmission of eyewitness accounts. Paul says, I want you to know that what I'm writing down here, I did not make up. I received it, and I received it, and now I'm writing it down in AD 50, 1, 52, whatever it might be, But in the 50s, therefore, within 20 years of the actual events of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the record being written into text. You say, well, why is that significant? Well, it's very, very significant. These are the facts. They were written at such a time as to make clear that the very heart of the gospel message concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ goes back right to the event. Well, you say, well, still you've lost me. Well, let me tell you this. If you go to become a theological student in a, in, a, in a university that does not teach the Bible, and you join their, their faculty of divinity, the prevalent view is this, 
that there was an historical Jesus about which we can know virtually nothing. The only Jesus that we now know is the Jesus who has been created by the New Testament church. And over the years, the New Testament church painted Jesus in the way they wanted him. And so they introduced all kinds of mythology attaching to this historical Jesus of Nazareth. And that the task of a New Testament theologian is to try and scrape away all of the mythology and get back to the historical Jesus. Well, fine. We get back to within 20 years of the Jesus event, and the testimony is clear, as we're about to see. We have recorded and rehearsed the events of Auschwitz, the horrible events of the Holocaust. Nobody is in any question about it, apart from a lunatic fringe that wants to deny it. Nobody can deny the reality of the pain and the hell and the disgrace of it all. Fifty years on, everybody knows. Why? Because it was passed down carefully from generation to generation, and it was written down. And everyone accepts it. With a 50-year time lag, nobody's questioning Auschwitz. With a 20-year time lag from the resurrection, nobody was questioning the facts of the resurrection. You see, the scholars have to be true to the material that they're given. If we're going to be scientific, we have to examine the evidence that is there, not the evidence we would like to be there. Now, for those of you who have understood that, good. For those of you who didn't, don't worry about it. And uh, ask somebody along the row. And they'll tell you, ask somebody else along the row. listening to Alistair Begg and a message in our series called Life After Death on Truth For Life. If you'd like to listen again or catch up on previous messages in this series, visit truthforlife.org. As Alistair discussed today, saving faith is much more than simply knowing the gospel and accepting it intellectually. However, faith does begin with knowledge. Romans 10:17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And at Truth For Life, our mission is to teach God's Word so that as men and women hear the truth, the Holy Spirit can work in their lives and lead them to salvation. With that end in mind, we're committed to making these daily messages available free of charge. But we're only able to do that because of listeners like you who commit to regular monthly donations. We call these listeners Truth Partners, and it's their faithful giving that enables people all around the world to grow in their knowledge of God's Word and to even hear the gospel for the first time. We'd love to have you join that team today. And when you do, we'll express our thanks by sending you a book titled Mission Accomplished. This is a fun, interactive devotional designed for families to study together in preparation for Easter. Beginning on Palm Sunday, you and your children can follow Jesus' steps from the cross to the resurrection and beyond. This is an excellent way to share the gospel with a child, with a grandchild, with a Sunday school class. Help your family focus on the true meaning of Easter this year by sharing the life-saving truth of the resurrection— Request Mission Accomplished when you become a Truth Partner today, or when you make a one-time donation to support this ministry. Call 888-588-7884 or go online to truthforlife.org slash truthpartner. To mail your donation, write to Truth For Life at P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. Be sure to include a note requesting the book Mission Accomplished. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us at Truth For Life, encouraging you to worship with your church family this weekend. Then join us Monday as Alistair continues our study in 1 Corinthians titled Life After Death. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.